Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, this uh, presentation today, I'm just going to very briefly introduce the whole area of pulse electric field uh, processing of foods. Uh, before I do that, I just would like to maybe just introduce myself and, and where I come from. Uh, my name is, is Jim Ling. I'm from the Institute of Food and Health in University College Dublin. Um, basically, the Institute of Food and Health, for those of you that are not familiar with it, it's, it's made up of just 27 academic staff, uh, 58 postdoc fellows at the moment, and 154 PhD students. And it's a relatively new establishment, I suppose that's why I'm, I'm uh, just mentioning it here today. Um, because uh, while in UCD we've been involved in food research in many, many aspects of food research for many, many years, uh, basically uh, the institute was set up to try and bring together the various groupings because we have quite a strong uh, base in primary production. We have a, a college farm in Lyons Estate where we have animals and crops growing. We have a strong nutrition, uh, food legislation, agricultural engineering program, food safety, food science and public health uh, are also areas that we're very strong in but basically it was like a disjointed jigsaw uh, the, the areas while there were some informal links between the various groupings and so on uh, the institute was set up to try and maybe be a little bit more strategic and, and align the groups a little bit better so the institute has formed into what we call seven pillars uh, nutrition food science I've highlighted in red which is the area that I'm involved in biosystems engineering food safety food law food and the consumer and food production and it's it's a very real thing it's not just a marketing tool that's used by UCD uh, we have a you know a strategic grouping who uh, kind of advise us on trends and up-and-coming trends uh, you know for in, in food research you know in, into the future and allow us to plan and be strategic going forward and it, it's a forum that we, we meet together as a group and it's it's been very very beneficial um, it's not an actual uh, there's no building as such called the Institute uh, of Food and Health in UCD. We all are still very much scattered around the campus, but as I said, we do meet uh, very frequently as a group. Within that machine, if you like, of the Institute, I, I'm just one little cog, uh, and my area of work is in the area of novel processing uh, technologies. And just before I start to talk specifically about pulse electric fields, um, I don't just work with pulse electric fields. I work with uh, a, a wide variety of technologies we have a range of, of thermal processing systems. Uh, we have ohmic heating on site. Uh, we've been working with that technology for many years and we recently acquired a, a 10 kilowatt continuous cooled electrode ohmic heating uh, system which we can use for pasteurization or UHT. We also recently have ordered a, a continuous microwave oven. Uh, we do some work with batch ovens obviously as well and we have some radio frequency heating capabilities. And then on the non-thermal uh, front, we have pulse electric fields, which I'll be talking to you about today. Uh, we also work with ultrasound, and we have some pilot scale ultrasound systems. And then we have some smaller scale light uh, technologies, uh, ultraviolet light, high intensity pulse light, and, and blue light systems that we use uh, very much on a lab scale. Um, I don't work on, in, uh, on this processing area on my own. Uh, I, I collaborate a lot with uh, other staff in, in UCD. Um, I'm a food scientist. I work a lot with food microbiologists, uh, enzymologists, uh, food engineers, uh, molecular biologists, even with Shea Fanning. Uh, so there's a wide variety of people within the Institute that uh, work with me uh, on this uh, or in this area. So. What I'm specifically here to talk to you about today is the whole area of pulse electric fields. And um, just if I may begin by just introducing this technology, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it already, but what pulse electric fields basically is, it involves applying very, very high voltages to, to foods. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know, voltages of over 100 kilovolts, that's over 100,000 volts, uh, or, or up to that order of magnitude. Uh, and these very, very high voltages are applied in, in very, very short pulses. Uh, you know, these pulses are 1 to 10 microseconds in, in duration, typically. And they can be applied at frequencies ranging from 10 to 1,000 uh, cycles per, per second. The total treatment time that's involved is, is quite short. Uh, and generally speaking, if you added all the pulses together, the, the actual exposure time is less than a second. So it's, it's a fairly small, uh, short time uh, and fits in well with a, a continuous type of process. To expose a food product to these uh, electrical fields, it needs to come in contact with uh, electrodes, but this can be done very, very easily in, in pipe work and so on. You can have pipes and pump liquid through continuously 
and have the electrodes fitted in the pipe so it's, it's very easy to apply it on a continuous basis. And the big thing that pulse electric fields does to, to foods is, is, is it permeabilizes membranes and this can be exploited in various ways which I'll, I'll outline to you later on. The final point, general point I make about it is classed as a non-thermal technology uh, and by that uh, I mean that it uh, you know, it, it, it does its job or its work or the things it does by a, a mechanism other than, than heat. And it's, as I said, it's this permeabilization of membrane. That's effectively how it works. Just to illustrate uh, permeabilization of, of membranes then, this just uh, shows a, a cell here and you have a cell membrane highlighted in pink. And uh, essentially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to quickly hone in on a section of that membrane there. And basically, uh, you know, when an electrical field is, isn't applied to that cell membrane, you have ions, uh, you know, within the cell and in the extracellular space. And basically, they're, you know, relatively randomly distributed around within the, the liquid of the cell. But what happens when a, a, an electrical field is applied is the ions try to move within that electrical field. So positives start to move towards negatives and negatives towards positives and so on. And Essentially, if the membrane is in the way, it acts like a wall, uh, so it effectively blocks the, the ions from moving. And at low electrical fields, uh, essentially, they, 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 they remain, remain separated by the, the actual uh, membrane, and, and really the electrical field has no effect on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the cell wall, or on the cell membrane, should I say. However, if the electrical field is, you know, the uh, field strength is increased up to a, a level approaching a critical value, these ions can actually punch holes in, in the membrane and up to a, a critical transmembrane potential of around one volt uh, essentially it can form holes uh, within the membrane but up to that critical uh, level there these holes can reseal once the electrical field is, uh, is removed but if that transmembrane potential is exceeded quite dramatically it can form permanent holes that can't repair themselves and that's where uh, the, the, the strength of electrical field or uh, pulse electric field processing comes in and this phenomenon of puncturing holes is known as electroporation. How can this be used? Uh, it can be exploited really in two broad areas. One is in the area of preservation where you can actually puncture holes in microbial cell walls. That just shows an image of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that's been electroporated there and you can see uh, that the membrane is well and truly punctured and that uh, microorganism has been inactivated by the application of pulse electric fields. And it can be exploited in the preservation of, of high uh, quality beverages is one area where it can be used. The other area that it can be used is in non-microbial cell uh, disintegration and that can be exploited in a huge range of areas. Uh, it can be used to speed up drying of fruits and vegetables, it can be used to enhance the extraction of juices and ingredients uh, from products and it can be used for a wide variety of other uh, applications, which I'll mention to you later. Things like accelerating uh, brine diffusion in meat, uh, you know, some suggestions that it may help with the tenderization of meat. So there's many, many different applications for it. Just to give you a little bit of history, um, application of electricity to foods goes back, I suppose, as far back as the 1920s, where uh, the first uh, publication, if you like, on uh, ohmic heating uh, came into play. But it's really the 1960s, 1967, uh, the work of Sale and Hamilton, that's really, uh, they're kind of credited as doing the first real systematic study of, of applying uh, pulse electric fuels to, to, to foods. And then there's a number of other milestones that have emerged since then. Uh, as I said, it's application to plants to improve yields and so on and extract uh, components and so on. That's a, a more recent thing, you know, from 2003 onwards. Um, just in terms of the literature then, just to quickly mention this point, uh, this is just data from the web of knowledge, uh, just to show the, the, the growth in the number of publications uh, on for of pulse electric fields for preservation purposes. You can see it really took off from, you know, between 1992 and 1996, there was a dramatic increase in the number of publications uh, in this area. And if we compare it to other uh, technologies, like for example, UV, ultrasound, uh, you know, they more or less took off more or less at the same time as well. High uh, pressure, which was discussed yesterday, uh, had a bit of a head start, maybe about a 10 year head start. So it has there's more publications out at this stage on, on high pressure processing. Uh, but certainly the others are, are, are catching up. Why or what was the trigger for this uh, increase in interest in these non-thermal technologies? Well, 
one of the, the reasons is, is they fitted in with this concept of minimal processing, where they're kind of viewed as being mild and having uh, limited impact on the quality of, of, of food products uh, while being successful for inactivating microorganisms. So uh, that's spurred a lot of research in this area. Just a, a quick point, and this just shows the lag, if you like, between publications and industrial installations, and this is actually data for, for high pressure processing, but uh, essentially uh, you can see here for high pressure processing the, where the uh, number of publications took off, and then you can see this is data supplied by one of the, the uh, commercial installations, Carl Tanella from NC Hyperbaric, but you can see there's kind of a lag between when the uh, technical information started to appear in the literature and uh, when industrial installations started to, 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 to emerge. Um, and, uh, you know, as I said, that's, uh, I suppose that there is a need for uh, a background of, of technical information. Just to, to put it into context then, uh, in terms of, of temperatures and costs, this is just a, 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 some data that uh, Wutger Heinz and, and Stefan Toffel sometimes put up. Uh, they have a lot of expertise in this area, but it shows thermal pasteurization typically heats products to uh, around you know, 70, 75, up to 80, 85 degrees centigrade. Thermal sterilization, then canning kicks in around 120 and you go up to UHT around 135, 140 degrees centigrade. So uh, that's just looking at these conventional technologies in terms of the, the temperatures that products are heated to. In terms of cost, pasteurization is, is cheaper, sterilization requires more, you know, you have over pressures and a little bit more complicated kit and so on. So it's, it's a little bit more expensive. And then to superimpose on that then pulse electric fields where it fits in, um, essentially first and foremost the first thing you notice is, is the temperature is considerably lower uh, that the product is heated to, uh, but the cost is, is higher, uh, so it's, 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 it is a more expensive technology. And I've kind of got it colour coded here, I'm not sure how clear it's coming out, but essentially extraction is to the left hand side in yellow. And extraction or you know getting juices from uh, cells and so on it tends to be a lower cost option than actually using pulse electric fields for preservation i'll come back to that point later on just to quickly superimpose uh, two other areas that are on this graph i'm not sure exactly how these figures and, and, and points are, 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 are actually calculated but essentially it shows the relationship between pef and high pressure processing and you can see High pressure processing is, is, is a more expensive uh, technology. There's a lot of steel involved in high pressure systems because of the big pressures involved and steel is expensive. So it makes the equipment more expensive than pulse electric field systems. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a fine uh, technology and uh, is, is, is doing quite well commercially. Irradiation is also down there. And again, as I said, I'm, not, I'm no expert on irradiation, but uh, it makes the point, I suppose, that irradiation is performed at a lower temperature but again, it's, it's a higher cost uh, system. In terms of the balance then in the literature between preservation and cell disintegration, the seesaw is very much leaning towards the, the preservation side. There's a lot more information uh, out there on preservation as opposed to cell uh, disintegration. Um, the main factors that influence microbial inactivation, I won't go through these in any great detail with you, but they're well, well documented. Um, electrical field strength is one. Once you go above the critical electrical field strength that forms these permanent pores, usually the, as a rule of thumb, the higher the field strength, the better. Treatment time, uh, you know, essentially, we're talking microseconds here, so, uh, you know, certainly increasing the treatment time initially will give you more of an effect, but this, it very quickly plateaus out. The shape of the pulse can be important, uh, square waves and exponential waves and so on. And the treatment temperature can also be, uh, uh, have an impact on the rate of microbial activation. It makes the membranes more fluid uh, and, and can help and make the, the formation of these pores, uh, be, they can be formed much more easily. Product factors, again, uh, you know, anything that I suppose that induces a stress on the bug can oftentimes render it a little bit more vulnerable. Although you can also have things like fats and carbohydrates can, that can have a protective effect on, on, on the, the actual bugs. So, uh, as I said, the composition can have an impact on uh, the, the, the actual microbial inactivation. And then just to, to quickly finish off on this point, uh, vegetative cells, it's quite successful for, but spores, really, it's, it's not a technology, uh, certainly by itself, that can give you any appreciable uh, spore kill. So it's, it's not really suitable for spores, but maybe with some elevated heat and so on that might be more successful. 
Uh, gram negatives tend to be a bit more uh, susceptible than gram positives as a rule of thumb and the size of the bug uh, also can be uh, can have an impact as a rule of thumb the bigger the better basically uh, so things like yeast and that tend to be a bit more vulnerable than bacteria and you can even get strain to strain variation and that's really you're getting into the the nitty-gritty of, of kind of molecular biology and so on at that level but it is a very real uh, phenomenon the work that we've done in UCD has really focused on um, using pulse electric fields uh, in a hurdle strategy. And just to, to quickly mention what I mean by that, um, if you took a, tra a traditional, say, severe heat process, something like, say, UHT, and you have your raw material here, which has a certain microbial load in it, and you put a heat hurdle in, 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 in place there, what basically that heat hurdle does is it, it's so severe that any microbial contamination that's within the product is, is basically uh, more or less eliminated uh, or brought to a commercially sterile state at least. So you have your preserved product uh, at the end of that heat process. Trouble with it is it's, it's a heat process so there can be negative effects in terms of nutrition, in terms of flavour, uh, in terms of quality of the product colour and so on. And what we've been doing is, is we've been playing around with not just one of these technologies on their own, but combining them together into a series of hurdles and uh, looking at the collective effect of them. So basically putting a bit of PEF in there, following it maybe with UV, possibly with a bit of ultrasound and high intensity light. And, and the idea being that combining two or more of these together would hopefully give you a, a better effect and avoid the, the heat uh, damage of the, the traditional process. We, we, we have a number of publications at this stage. I think we've 20 to 23 publications at this stage, and that's not a lot. There's groups with a hell of a lot more, uh, Dennis. Uh, but we really largely focus on, on, on beverages in this work. Uh, certainly a lot of work on, on milk, but also a lot on juices and combinations of juices and smoothies and so on. Obviously, I can't go through the whole lot of these in, in any detail, but I'll just make a few quick general points uh, on, on using pulse electric fields in this way. Uh, we work a lot, instead of with pathogens, we work a lot with surrogates for path pathogens. So this is an example of some work we did with Listeria inocua, which is a surrogate for Listeria monocytogenes, and it was work that was performed in low-fat milk. What we did in this experiment is we combined thermosonication, that's ultrasound with a little bit of heat. Uh, we looked at it on its own, we looked at pulse electric fields on their own, and then we combined the two of these together uh, to see what we got. And we had as a control a conventional heat treatment. And our conventional heat treatment was 72 degrees for 26 seconds, which uh, you know, we, we placed our product through. We have a tubular heat exchanger, so we ran our products through that. In a nutshell, the impact on the stereo inocula, we got seven log cycle reduction with our conventional heat treatment. Ultrasound, under the conditions that we examined in this work, only gave us 1.2 logs, uh, or even less than that. And PEF, we got up to 3.3 logs. So certainly neither of these on their own gave anything near what our uh, control heat treatment did. However, when we combined them together, we certainly got very much in the ballpark of our conventional heat treatment. We got up to 6.9 log, uh, you know, or 6.8 to 6.9 log, depending on the process conditions. So really, just in a nutshell, um, the, the summary of this work is really that individually, uh, you, you, you mightn't get the same effect that you will get with uh, a heat treatment, but if you combine them together, you certainly can get uh, comparable uh, inactivations of, of, of pathogens or at least pathogenic surrogates. Um, I could put up many more examples uh, of this type of work with other surrogates in other media and so on but effectively the conclusions from this is more or less the same. It is possible to, to, to achieve similar inactivations to what you get with conventional uh, pasteurization treatments. Another quick uh, one I just quickly mentioned to you then is, is more in the area of spoilage and shelf life. And this again is work we did in low fat, uh, low and full fat milk indeed as well. And what we were looking at here was the native microbiota, uh, you know, the native flora in, in, in the milk basically. And in this work we combined preheating uh, with pulse electric fields. And uh, essentially what we uh, looked at here was uh, 
we compared them to, uh, again, a conventional heat treatment, 72 degrees for 26 seconds. What we got here uh, with our conventional heat treatment, we got 6.1 log. Um, for preheating on its own, we got up to 4.6 log, depending on the, the, the preheating conditions. Um, with pulse electric fields on their own, we got up to 6.4 log, so certainly in the same order of magnitude to our conventional heat treatment. And we actually got up to 7 log uh, with uh, our uh, combined, uh, or with, with the combination of the two. Another interesting finding of this work was we did a shelf life study. And uh, what we found, in fact, with the conventional heat treatment is we got a 14 day shelf life. And above, after 14 days, we were above uh, the, our, 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 our limit, if you like. Whereas with the combined treatment, we actually extended this uh, up to 21 days. So really in conclusion, uh, certainly uh, pulse electric fields applied in, in, in this way uh, certainly uh, could represent uh, you know, a valid alternative to a conventional heat treatment for extending the shelf life of, of products. And again, I could give you many other examples of, of this, but that's just one for today. Just to, 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 to finish off on this area then, uh, just in terms of quality, uh, enzymes and vitamins and so on, this is just looking at pulse electric fields on its own. Uh, and again, it's full fat milk and looking at two particular areas. One is enzyme inactivation, and uh, we have four enzymes uh, within milk, uh, native enzymes, lactoperoxidase, lipase, alkaline phosphatase, and protease. And essentially, without going into it in any great detail, we got very variable results uh, depending on the, the treatment conditions. With lactoperoxidase, very little impact. Uh, protease, we got up to a 37.6% reduction. So certainly, uh, with the conditions we examined here, we didn't completely eliminate any of these enzymes or even come close to it. Now, that said, with other media and other enzymes, we have uh, you know, gotten up to much higher uh, levels of an activation uh, of different enzymes in different drinks. But this is a common theme you'll see running through the literature on pulse electric fields. It's, it's great for inactivating. Uh, microorganisms or vegetative microorganisms, but when you get into enzymes, it's much more variable, um, which can be a good or a bad thing, uh, depending on, on what you're trying to do. Um, also in this work, we looked at vitamins, and uh, you know, we looked at water-soluble and fat-soluble vitamins, and effectively, uh, the pulse electric field treatments had no impact on, on the vitamins, which again is, is a positive thing. Um, Looking at the literature, I'm, I'm not going to go into this in any detail. It's, there's a lot out there on vitamin C, and the point I'll make about it, uh, this is just some of them, some of the papers. Uh, PEF, vitamin C is a heat labile vitamin, and uh, that's why people study it a lot. And uh, effectively, uh, PEF really has very little impact on vitamin C, whereas you know, conventional heat processes can reduce it 20, 30%, no problem. Uh, so uh, that's a positive. Uh, and other vitamins as well. Uh, this is other literature that's out there. There's, uh, you know, again, in milk, vitamins A, D3, E, B1, B2. Uh, effectively, those four papers found no significant effect for PEF under a variety of conditions. And uh, this work here was biotin, folic acid, and pantothenic acid. Now, one thing I will say about this is it was quite a severe uh, process. It was performed back in 2007, very severe conditions used. And there was a reduction in, in these vitamins, but it was certainly uh, no more of the order of magnitude of what you would get with a very mild uh, heat treatment, a mild pasteurization, uh, and certainly uh, much lower than what you would have in, in a conventional, more severe heat process. Again, antioxidant capacity, carotenoids, flavonoids, I'll just quickly make the point. Uh, these um, entities can be reduced by heat treatments and you know, the more severe the heat treatment, the greater the reduction you get in these, uh, the, the, these compounds and so on. Uh, but uh, PEF treatments really have been found uh, you know, time and time again to have a much lesser effect on, on, on these uh, compounds or, or antioxidant capacity. So uh, that's certainly a, a very uh, positive thing for PEF. So to sum up on, on its use for preservation, it's, it's been investigated now for 20 plus years. Um, a lot of the work has focused on 
liquids, fruits, vegetable juices, milk, dairy products and so on. Um, it's very good for successful inactivation of vegetative cells. You get, you know, a lot of time you see in the literature a five log reduction. That's kind of stems from the FDA in the United States, um, you know, kind of looking for a five log reduction uh, of vegetative cells and it's quite good for doing that. For spores alone, uh, it's certainly, you know, it, 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 it won't give you any appreciable spore inactivation. And enzymes, as I said to you, it's a little bit variable. Um, impact on eating quality, I didn't put up results there, but it certainly has minimal impact there, and nutritive value, minimal impact as well. So it's something that, uh, a technology that certainly is finding some uh, footage in, in the area of, of high quality beverage production. And just to, to show you uh, and give you an idea of where it's at, um, it's very difficult to get specific information from the equipment manufacturers. And in fairness, it's not that they're not, they don't want to tell you, but they're tied up a lot of the time in confidentiality agreements. But uh, Stefan Toffel from DIL gave me some information and it shows the systems that they have. They manufacture pulse electric field systems and uh, they have two commercial scale units uh, that they make, a 30 and an 80 kilowatt. And uh, you can see they have three of them used in fruit juice uh, manufacture. And one of them in particular is uh, a company in the Netherlands uh, who are basically using, the, they have freshly squeezed juices and they're extending the, the shelf life of these freshly squeezed juices from eight days up to something like 21 days uh, by applying this technology. So it's a premium pro quality product and they're you know, getting a substantial increase in their shelf life. If I could superimpose on top of that then the second area that pulse electric fields are used, and this again is information supplied to me by uh, Stefan Toffel and I'm very grateful to him for, for giving it to me but it shows again their commercial systems but it shows them being used for cell disintegration and you can see straight away there's a lot more systems out there commercial sales systems out there that are being used for cell disintegration and uh, again you know the, the details for most of these are fairly confidential but there's one company in Orensing in Germany who are using it for potatoes and I believe what the application is, 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 is for, uh, you know, certainly one of the areas they're, they're using it for is, is for softening the potatoes for, for cutting. And it's this huge energy savings to be made by uh, pre-treating the potatoes with PEF and it makes them much easier to cut uh, and so on. And they actually have scaled up to a, an 80 kilowatt unit for doing this. And uh, as I said, there's, there's other larger units out there. So the point I would make about cell disintegration is while there's a lot more known about preservation. As it stands at the moment, it looks like the, the cell disintegration is, is, is getting more traction commercially. Um, now, as I said, it's difficult for me to, you know, I, I can only judge it on, on, on the information I've been given, but uh, as I said, it, it would appear to be the case. And why is that? And I just, again, this is data that was, uh, from a different talk given again by Stefan Toffel, but it, it basically shows the cost of, uh, the investment cost for preservation versus cell disintegration. And um, essentially across the x-axis here, you have production scale, and then across the y-axis you have investment. And essentially, when you compare on comparable uh, production scales in tons per hour, preservation is, 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 is much more expensive. And the reason for that is what you're trying to pour out in preservation are, are microorganisms that are considerably smaller, their membranes are considerably uh, thinner, and therefore you need much more electrical fields to get this critical transmembrane membrane potential. So it makes the systems more expensive, whereas for cell disintegration you're dealing with big plant cells, uh, you know, it, you don't need the same severity of, of electrical field strengths to disintegrate them, and uh, as I said, it, it makes it a much cheaper uh, option. In terms of processing costs, and again, this is DIL figures, but uh, they typically say about one cent a, a litre, which is, is 10 euro per tonne if you calculate it uh, out. Whereas for cell disintegration, they talk about one euro per tonne. So it's, it's the cost is considerably less. Uh, so that may also influence the reason why it's, 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 it's uh, been taken up more commercially. While we're on the topic of, of decontamination, another area I'll just quickly mentioned here is, is wastewater treatment. And the other big player in, in terms of, of commercial systems is a company called Diversified Technologies. And Mike Kempe, I, I, I know and has been very helpful to me over the years as well. 
but they actually uh, certainly have been involved in food processing but according to what he tells me they're getting much more interest in the whole area of wastewater treatment and the, the two real areas that they're, they're working in one is biosolids in, in waste streams and one of the things they're doing is, is they are killing pathogens uh, for sure with pulse electric fields but there's more to it than that they're also using them to uh, break up uh, cell walls in these biosolids and uh, you know when they're when these biosolids are going in for digestion and so on say for methane production or whatever they, they the, the sugars that are released are, are you know are, are, are much uh, you know from the cells are, are you know assimilating the whole digestion and so on so they're getting more things like an increase in methane production and a decrease in the volumes of, of biosolids needing disposal and this this seems to be taking off you know uh, quite and, and, and be quite successful uh, for, for, for this type of area another big area of interest in the states is um, sewage outflows they, they have a problem and I suppose we have it everywhere really but in st when they have storm waters the, 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 the sewage systems are not able to handle it and they, 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 they basically overflow and it's caused a lot of problems over the years beaches have been shut shellfish beds closed and so on and so on and what they have built is a relatively low cost system that can be fitted in so that when you know you get these stormwater loads they turn on this system and it, uh, the, the overflow flows through it and um, it basically it's, it's a, a much more satisfactory alternative to chlorination and ozonation from the point of view of, of these are noxious enough substances to be handling and it, it avoids kind of turbidity problems that you can have with UV so uh, this seems to be another area that they're, they're certainly focusing on just to, to, to finish off on, on commercial applications, um, I, I, this kind of falls outside the decontamination area, but I'll mention it just, just nonetheless. Three other huge areas, that's, or, or big areas, or big growth areas. One is, is drying rate uh, for, for fruits and vegetables. Uh, and again, this comes back to electroporation, puncturing holes in cells, letting liquids be removed more easily. And, uh, you know, PEF can be fitted into existing plants and can increase throughput uh, for, for drying plants and, and so on. And this is, is achieving some commercial traction. Another quite successful area in, in, in commercially is, is juice yield. Um, you know, breaking up, you know, you can see here examples, orange, carrot, pineapple and so on. Breaking up cells, you get an increase in the yield of, of juices compared to untreated products and, uh, you know, can be helpful in that way. And that's, that's, there's quite a lot of commercial interest in that too. And indeed, the, another huge area is extraction of, of ingredients. I mean, this started with sugar, actually, treating sugar beet to improve the extraction of sugar, but it's gone into functional ingredients and bioactives now, anthocyanins and uh, polyphenols from grapes, for example, um, microalgae and extracting functional compounds from these types of, of matrices is another big area. And the final one then, uh, I'll just again mention it's it's, not really in the in the area of, of, of decontamination but these areas are more at a research uh, kind of a, a level really um, but one area that we're working on uh, is is just trying to apply pulse electric fields to meat to see can it accelerate the tenderization of something like beef i mean it you know can take up to 21 days to, to condition beef to make it tender for for consumption so introducing pulse electric fields there if it could rupture lysosomes and bring enzymes into play that would tenderize the meat and so on. It could have, uh, you know, huge commercial implications and reduce the actual conditioning times which have, would have major savings for processors. Another area is, is curing of meat and uh, DIL have done work in this area. We're also working in it, uh, accelerating the, you know, again using the electroporation to puncture cells and allow the brine to diffuse more rapidly into meats is another area. Uh, DIL um, in, in Germany have also looked at uh, accelerating the drying of, of, of meats, again using electroporation uh, to accelerate the, the drying of meats. And we've also done some work actually with a farmer at Lone IT student uh, looking at decontamination of poultry, the particular reference to Compilobacter. Um, and you know, we found variations in strains and so on, and resistance to, to it, but not particularly great um, as non thermal technologies goes for. For, for decontamination of, of, of meat though, but could be used in things like brine tanks and, 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 and or um, you know scalding tanks and so on. So to sum up then, um, for preservation, it's well proven. There's lots of data out there. Um, 
pulse electric fields by itself, it may need an additional little bit of help, mild heat, uh, you know, certainly when it comes to enzymes and spores. Um, it is, ex it is more expensive, so it's unlikely you'll see it applied, say, on, say, the manufacture of fruit juices from concentrates. But if you're in the business of producing a premium, freshly squeezed juice product, you know, the extension to your shelf life may justify the cost. So that's one, uh, you know, that's the whole preservation side. Cell disintegration, um, there's less uh, known, less published about it, uh, but certainly it would appear that it's gaining more traction commercially. Why that is? Probably the cost for one. Uh, it's certainly a much, you know, it's, it's a lower cost option than, than preservation. And also, in fairness to the food industry, uh, you know, they may be, you know, they're well familiar with thermal processing and, uh, you know, th there's a lot of data out there on, on D values and Z values from microorganisms and so on uh, when it comes to heat processing, but they, they, they might be, uh, you know, they might be a bit more conservative about applying uh, pulse electric fields to, 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 to uh, products for preservation purposes, but they might be, uh, might be as conservative when it comes to this type of area. But uh, I think it's, it's, it's an area that there are many, many niche applications still to be discovered. Um, in terms of facilities available, uh, there's facilities in UCD, there's facilities here in Athlone IT. We have uh, two systems, um, this is our DIL uh, 5 kilowatt system, it's capable of processing about 100 litres an hour, it's a continuous flow system there. Um, and we have the pumps and CIP and SIP systems built in around that as well and the aseptic filling uh, capability on it as well. And the contact details, if you need to speak to people about it, is I've put Neil's uh, details down in that loan IT or my details are down there for, for UCD. And uh, just to finish off, I'd like to acknowledge the financial support, support of the various funding agencies that we've been involved in over the years. And also I'd like to sincerely thank um, you know, the, the two DIL and Diversified Technologies for being so frank with me in terms of, of information uh, on, on commercial applications for these technologies. So, so thank you very much.